Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have some of that cool stuff, a fascinating segment about a language called Esperanto, and a quick and dirty tip about the difference between fall and autumn. But first, today's episode is sponsored by Bona Hardwood Floor Cleaner, the easy way to make your floors shine. Bona's water-based mop solutions earned the Green Guard Gold certification. That means they're safe for your family and pets and for the planet. Bona comes ready to use. Just spray and mop. Bona Hardwood Floor Cleaner is available at most retailers where floor cleaning products are sold, including Amazon and Bona.com. For cleaning tips and exclusive offers, visit bona.com, bona.com slash grammar. Have you ever sighed over the fact that there are two words in English pronounced eight, yet one of them is spelled A-T-E, while the other is spelled E-I-G-H-T? Have you rolled your eyes because though and through are spelled almost exactly the same, but sound totally different? Have you ever failed miserably trying to explain to a kid why the past tense of walk is walked, but the past tense of run is ran and slide is slid? If so, have I got a language for you. It's called Esperanto, and it's blessedly free of the inconsistencies, illogic, and irregularities that make English so frustrating to learn, especially as a second language. Esperanto was the brainchild of L. L. Zamenhof, a Polish eye doctor born in 1859, who went by the pseudonym Dr. Esperanto, that is, Dr. Hopeful. What he hoped for was a world where all humans could easily communicate with each other using a common language, one that was simple, easy to learn, and detached from any political or cultural significance. He saw this language as a great equalizer. It would be a second language that anyone could learn and instantly be on the same footing as anyone else. Zamenhof worked on his idea for years. Then, in 1905, he published Fundamento de Esperanto, a primer for his new international language. Its words are derived from roots found in many European languages, particularly Romance languages like French, Italian, and Spanish. The beauty of Esperanto lies in its simplicity, which starts with pronunciation. The Esperanto alphabet has 28 letters, and each letter makes one and only one sound. For example, A makes the ah sound we hear in the French ami. Never the hard A of name or the uh sound of amigo. The letter C makes only the soft sound we hear in Caesar or Circe. If you want the hard C sound in cat, you use the letter K. And if you want the CH sound in chair, you use a special Esperanto letter that doesn't exist in English, a C with a circumflex on top known as chu. This is in contrast to English in which one letter can make multiple sounds. Think of the G in Greg versus the one in George, for example, or how people argue about whether G-I-F is pronounced gif or jif. In Esperanto, one letter equals one sound. Better yet, every single letter in a word is pronounced. There's no such thing as silent letters. Muscle, which has a silent C and E in English, becomes muscolo in Esperanto, spelled M-U-S-K-O-L-O. Receipt, which has a silent I and P in English, becomes recepto, spelled R-E-C-E-P-T-O. Bridge, which has a silent D and E in English, changes completely and becomes ponto, spelled P-O-N-T-O. Stress is also standardized in Esperanto. Words are always stressed on the second-to-last syllable. No more confusion between invalid versus invalid, for example. No more homographs. If this were an Esperanto word, the stress would always be on the second-to-last syllable, and it would be invalid. Long story short, if you can see a word in Esperanto, you can say it. No exceptions. Another cool thing about Esperanto is that all words provide a built-in clue to tell you what part of speech they are. For example, all three words I just said, muscolo, recepto, and ponto, end in O. 
That's because all nouns in Esperanto end in O. Yes, all of them. In the same vein, all adjectives end in A, and all adverbs end in E. All verbs in the infinitive end in I, and all conjugated verbs end in S. Learning how to conjugate verbs is also super simple. Verbs have five specific endings for five specific tenses, and these endings stay the same regardless of who's doing the action. In contrast, in English, verbs change their form, are inflected in relation to the subject, even when you're using the same tense. For example, when you conjugate the verb to be in the present tense, you get I am, you are, and she is, three different forms. In Esperanto, verb forms stay the same, only the endings change based on the tense. Verbs in the present tense and in AS. Those in the past tense and in IS. Those in the future tense and in OS. Those in the conditional and in US. And those in the imperative and in you, like this. I sit or I'm sitting would become me sidas. Me is the Esperanto word for I. I sat or I was sitting would be me sidis. I will sit would be me sidos. I would sit would be me sidus. And the command sit would be sidu. All verbs are conjugated this way. I repeat, there are no irregular verbs. Hallelujah. A final simplification is that there are only 13 numerals in the language, 0 through 10, 100, and 1,000. All other numbers are expressed using a combination of these 13. For example, 11 in Esperanto is dec unu, literally 10 one. 12 is dec du, or 10 two. 20 is du dec, that is two tens. And 22 is du dec du, that is two tens two. This may not sound important, but the way we treat numbers in English can be difficult for second language learners and for anyone with dyslexia. In English, when we're talking about numbers between 10 and 20, we put the unit first and the 10 after. 13 is essentially 310. But we reverse that pattern when we hit the 20s and beyond, when we say the 10s first and the units after. 23, for example. The original dream of L.L. L. Zamenhof, a world united by a common language, hasn't yet happened. But if you've been inspired by this story, there are lots of places to learn more. There are conferences and associations for Esperanto speakers, and you can learn Esperanto via free apps like Duolingo. And Google Translate now includes Esperanto in its drop-down menu. Who knows, maybe learning a few words of Esperanto today could help us create a more peaceful world tomorrow. Dr. Zamenhof would want us to feel hopeful. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. Before we get to season names, today's show is sponsored by Masterclass. A couple of months ago, one of my friends was raving to me about how great Masterclass is, so I was really excited when I saw they were going to sponsor the show. Masterclass is your portal to learn from the best of the best through online classes taught by masters of their craft. They have classes in tons of categories, including writing classes taught by amazing writers like Margaret Atwood, Malcolm Gladwell, James Patterson, and Joyce Carol Oates. You can access Masterclass on any device, and every class is broken out into quick video lessons and downloadable materials that you can explore at your own pace. Right now, I'm taking the writing class by Judy Bloom, who's always been one of my favorite writers. She answers questions that I've always wondered, like what inspired her to write such relatable stories. Also, one of her hallmarks is that she writes really vivid characters. So she teaches exercises like having your characters write a letter so you can learn their voices. It's insightful, and I can't wait to learn more. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every masterclass, and as a listener, you get 15% off the annual all-access pass. That's a whole year of learning from these amazing people. Go to masterclass.com slash grammar. That's masterclass.com slash grammar for 15% off masterclass. 
Fall officially starts Monday, September 23rd this year in the Northern Hemisphere. But Starbucks doesn't care. The pumpkin spice latte, a hallmark of fall, has been available for weeks. All the excitement online got me thinking about seasons and why this one seems to have two names, fall and autumn. And just to make it more confusing, the first day of fall is also called the autumnal equinox. On the first day of fall and spring, actually, too, day and night are the same length. And the word equinox comes from the same root as the word equal, showing that in this 24-hour period, day and night are equal. Fall is more common in the U.S., and autumn is more common in Britain. Fall gets its name from the longer phrase, fall of the leaf, that was first used in the mid-1500s. Spring comes from a similar phrase, spring of the leaf. For whatever reason, the name fall took hold in America more than it did in Britain, and in the U.S., fall is the standard season name. British speakers are more likely to use the older name, autumn, which came into English from Old French in the late 1300s. The first reference in the Oxford English Dictionary is from Chaucer. It reads, Autumn comes again, heavy of apples. Season names such as fall and winter are lowercase, unless they're part of an official name, such as the Winter Olympics. I love that both fall and spring describe what's happening to leaves in those times of year. Now that I know about fall of the leaf and spring of the leaf, when I'm out on a walk, I look at the trees and their changing leaves in a whole new way. Finally, I have a familect story about a number. Hi, Grammar Girl. Thanks so much for releasing two episodes in a week. I am so excited. And I wanted to share a story from my family. Some of the best ones are from when we were little kids. For example, we would, instead of using the word 11, we'd always say Yemena instead, because one of my sisters, when she was a toddler, accidentally said it that way. Thanks so much. And keep doing what you're doing. It's pretty great. Thanks for sharing your story. If everyone spoke Esperanto, maybe your sister would have been able to say Dec Unu for 11, or maybe not. Tell me your familect story. That's a word your family and only your family uses, and I love to hear the stories behind why you use these made-up words. Leave a voicemail message with your story at 833214 girl and you might hear it on the show. I'm Mignon Fogarty, Grammar Girl and author of the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. And my audio producer is Nathan Sims. You can find articles that go with the main segments of the podcast at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs> 